going so fast. Um, this is a guy in another Bangladeshi town um, showing in a slum, showing um, how high up the water comes when it floods because of sea level rise. Um, uh, so we're at a transition, we, we, we are urbanizing, which, which could be a solution to a lot of our problems, but we're not doing it in a very well-planned uh, way for, for um, millions, billions even, of people. Um, this is uh, a favela, Rio Rosina favela, one of the biggest favelas in uh, Rio, which um, has recently undergone quite a few really, really good changes where, where people's standard of living and their comfort of living has um, accelerated massively in just the last 10 years. And it might not look like much. Um, it's very dense, low, low living, not, 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 not the high rise living that you see in um, parts of, say, Southeast Asia. But actually, this is, I think, one of the most hopeful signs of, um, <coughs> of our changing planet because, because people are, are starting to reclaim their, their um, dignity and their hope in life. Um, that's it. That's, um, that was my journey. <laughs> um, thank you.
you mentioned the longevity of the uh, high altitude Tibetans. Um, is, is, is there any um, research yet on the Chinese that are overrunning Tibet? Um, are they adapting quickly um, or not? Are, are they dying off uh, more rapidly than the indigenous Tibetans? Uh, well, I only have like anecdotal uh, evidence that um, non-Tibetans living in those parts of uh, Tibet actually do find it difficult, and they actually don't necessarily feel that well most of the time. So, um, you know, people do. I haven't, you know, I haven't. This is purely anecdotal. I haven't been up there a little bit last year. Uh, people do say that they actually. Uh, of course, not all of uh, Tibet is necessarily <coughs> that high, but most, most of the Tibetan plateau is pretty high. And um, there's certainly anecdotal evidence that people do find it quite difficult if they don't have this genetic adaptation. I mean, you've been up there, really. I mean, it must be pretty high. <coughs> I mean, what's it like? What's it like? Uh, well, I've been up there for short periods of time, and it's like you, you forget. I remember when someone was taking a photograph, and I was like somewhere else, and they said, oh, like, come and join this photograph, and I, so I ran to catch up with them. <laughs> um, I thought they were under a minefield or something, and they were just like worried that I was just going to like collapse because you yeah. just literally do run out of oxygen. You know, it is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. But but, but you see people, <coughs> you see people playing baseball, running around, having fun. No, so I was interested <laughs> when you mentioned the um, density of populations being very important for this cultural transmission. Mm -hmm. Respect to chimpanzees, do you get more cultures, more of these 39 identified cultures appearing in, in high density populations? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think uh, I mean, what we're just really talking about there is, is the sort of acceleration in, in cumulative culture in, in, in the human case, um, which is, in terms of even human evolution, is a re relatively sort of re recent uh, development. And I think it, 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 it um, uh, if, if we go back into sort of uh, early human evolution, I don't know, into the Stone Age, the early Stone Age, uh, cultural uh, change was, was extremely slow then. I mean, the, the first sort of major transition in, in stone tools was from the very primitive Oldowan tools, which is a few chips knocked off, to these lovely symmetrical Acheulean blades, uh, pear shaped uh, blades. I'm sure you've all, you've all seen. But that hardly changed for about a, a million years. So I mean, it was a long time before the cumulative cultural change started. And at, at that point, you can, you can detect all the evidence of these changes in, in, in population. But I mean, it, also, it raises the interesting possibility that because because great apes, for example, do live at pretty low population densities, mm -hmm. so it does raise you know if you want to do a sort of mind game into a plant of the apes type film or something like that. I mean, you know, it does. Because I think one of the things that one of the interesting uh, points that came out of this paper is that you know there have been obviously temptations in the past to to describe some of these um, human differences between populations in cultural complexity as uh, you know you know could it be um, you know could there be differences in ability between human populations and things like that and it's quite possible that it's it's literally just population density. It's, some of these traditions can't take off in low density uh, areas, and maybe the primates have just never had a high enough density population for long enough yeah, and to do anything very spectacular. You know. Might we lose chief <coughs> matches as the density goes down? I mean, is that, is that, yes, is that I mean, I think we're, we're losing chief cultures already, as it were, where as the communities are, are being compressed and they're going extinct. Which is kind of yeah, um, an analogous situation, I suppose, to human small language groups, uh, you know, places like New Guinea and, and South America, where there have been hundreds of, of uh, tiny local language groups, and they're dying out for, for, uh, for a similar kind of process. And I think the same thing is happening with the chimpanzee culture. So we're not just losing chimpanzees, which we're also doing um, sort of, uh, great apes, but uh, the local cultures will be dying out. 
first, if I could just add, add one thing to the notion of what, what, what restricts cultural transmission in uh, animals like the great apes. Uh, one thing might be the, the density, but there's a number of other factors as well. And um, one is who you copy. Um, and we all know in the human case, um, there's a, a tendency, for example, to copy high status individuals. You know, or, uh, David Beckham cuts his hair one way, then suddenly you know, there's, there's a load of young men out there just doing the same. We're very prone to that kind of effect. And we found the same thing in, in chimpanzees. So if, if a high ranking individual starts doing something, others are more likely to do that. However, what happens in nature is that the individuals who move between groups tend to be uh, females who have a low status when in environment. And so although they may know uh, some, some new tricks like, like nut cracking, it may be that no one really attends too much to what they're doing. And there's, there's a lot of innovations that have been recorded in chimpanzees, but they've not spread, they, they, as it were, still forward. So there's that kind of uh, limitation as well.
the ability to record information came in, in other words, the use of symbols, um, so, that it, it would be, so that knowledge could be built upon that, uh, and uh, not just on the basis of the population. Density. I mean, that's very recent. But that, but you know, that's uh, that's an interesting point about um, you know, acceleration, because obviously, once you once you start being able to, uh, you know, you, you know, I mean, I know already talked about how it all was started off rather slowly, and then and like a lot of these processes, you can imagine it being a sort of exponential curve. But once it starts building, and that that um, I mean, I oh God, I don't know when did writing start. I mean, it's only literally. But then printing and then the internet yes, is a I huge mean, And that would have been sort of very few individuals would ever really have made any use of it until it became you know, literally in the last, you know, then books and whatever, just in the last uh, few hundred of that. And then internet's obviously another, you know, it, it takes off again. And you can imagine it's completely sort of changed the way we teach our children and what we value and, you know, going back to this gene culture code that we should imagine suddenly a whole load of new cognitive skills that weren't useful at all in our very recent history are suddenly incredibly useful and get you all sorts of important jobs and all kinds of things. So you can imagine that um, that's changing everything extremely, extremely, extremely fast. Um, it might not be helpful in the next <laughs> one or two people in a society that can yeah. contribute to yeah. their knowledge yeah. and actually write down and have the decision, you know, yeah. the, the one person who speaks Latin in the village or whatever, yeah. you know, it's it's all of us, we can all do it, children are programming, you know, um, they're, they're coming up with, with um, new ways of thinking about things yeah. that they write down and are somebody else living in another part of the globe can then read and add to and, yeah. and so, I mean, it's, it's so, I mean, extraordinary even, part. Even just in the last probably... Um, ten years or so, like scientific papers were largely within the confines of universities. That yeah, we've got open access now to so all the journals, and you know. now you can download. Mm -hmm. You know, there's now almost everything we publish now has to be openly available on the internet. So suddenly, the whole world can read papers but have become part of the normal. Yes. So 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 before want to learn. I want to take be able to take a couple okay. more questions. Before before we um, have to wrap up, um, one is that have you got one up there? No, no. Uh, just down at the front there. <coughs> sorry, down this gentleman, Mike. Uh, and then one up there. Um, Andy, when they did the experiment with the chimp children and the human children on the artificial fruit, did any of the, did anyone ask the children why they copied everything, even though it wasn't necessary? Um, it has, has, has been done. <laughs> um, children of the age that we were testing were sort of about three and four years old. Um, I mean, you can ask them those kind of questions, and generally you don't get much sense from it, you know, so <laughs> they, they, they will tend to say something. But, um, it doesn't generally sort of help understand uh, why they're doing it. What has been done is, is to really see if, if, if you can change uh, this over invitation tendency by actually sort of asking them not to copy any, any silly things that you know, you can see done. Um, and really sort of you know tell them not to. Um, and the results of that was that they, they still did it. So it, it was it was concluded that you know it, it's really almost like an automatic uh, process that you can't kind of uh, reason through. Um, and I said we did it with three and four year olds to begin with. Um, and our first question was what, when do when children grow out of this sort of scene. And so we did it with older children and found they did it even more. And now we've done it with adults. And we found that most of them here are adults do it even more actually. So I've now I've now come around to the view that um, so you can ask me well why do I do it? And I think probably the answer is that uh, the kind of the one I gave really it's a sort of a, a, a rule of thumb, you know, you see so much attention to doing this. Uh, action, even though it doesn't make some sense, um, it's a good rule of thumb uh, to co copy uh, what they do. Brilliant. That maybe explains how we've 
accelerated our, our um, cultural savings so rapidly. Gentlemen here, and possibly one over here. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just, we've done all about cultural, cultural transmission. I was just wondering to anyone, but perhaps uh, Ruth, whether you could say something uh, perhaps on memes and whether actually talking about cultural mistakes uh, in terms of cultural tra transmission and memes as a method of that transmission, maybe <coughs> as an explanation for cultural mistakes and inverted commas becoming uh, sort of in societies. Uh, Well, I mean, as I said, this, I, I did give some examples at, just at the very end of um, my talk. Um, and probably the word meme is used a little bit less than it was, just because it, it, I mean, I know it's deliberately trying to sound like the word gene, but just by trying to sound like the word gene, it, 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 it caused some confusions in, in the debate. So I think now we're been talking about like cultural variation or cultural traits. Um, I think there's a big debate in um, things like why we have such so few children is an interesting area because that that doesn't seem to make any sense in terms of natural selection, but in terms of the idea that we're promoting educational values or intense investment in a small number of children does seem to be uh, a fairly plausible explanation for why we're, you, know, you might call that a cultural mistake, if, if by mistake you mean something that doesn't necessarily promote the spread of our genes. Um, so I think that might be one of the, you know, one of the examples of what you're talking about. Um, I mean, one of the other examples, I guess, something like religion, I'm not at all convinced that that's necessarily <coughs> bad. Thing at all, I think that might be uh, a, a cultural adaptation. That it's actually universal. You know, it's very, very widely spread, and it might just be that um, you know societies that have strong, cohesive beliefs in this kind of thing actually um, are. You know, it's actually quite a useful thing to have on your side, as it were. So perhaps it's not an evolutionary puzzle at all. Um, so I think it's case by case, really. I think you know a lot of studies are now being done on these kind of evolutionary puzzles because they're, uh, they're, they're you know, they are, they are perhaps the interesting questions. We understand quite a lot about how natural selection works and on animal behavior and, you know, are things different um, to what extent? The, the, the term means coined, was it? It's not by Rich Dawkins. Yeah. And his, his sort of classic example of it was that was written, I guess, in the 1980s, was um, wearing a baseball cap backwards, and that this idea seemed to spread through human populations, and it did, but you know, I think that, that means essentially gone extinct, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're beyond that one. Anyway, uh, but Deborah, have we got time for one more, couple more, maybe? One more question. Um, there's a question here, I believe. Yes, it's Jeff. Um, is there any evidence that chimpanzees learn to cook? And if not, what significance might that have had in human evolution? Um, well, there's, uh, there's been a lot of work on, on cookery, cookery and uh, significance of cookery in human evolution. Um, this book by Richard Wrangham, with a W. w Wrangham, uh, all about that, and I think that's quite compelling. Chimpanzees, I mean, in the wild, um, haven't got anywhere near that. Um, but we know that you know they have a capacity, the kind of social learning capacity I, I mentioned, means that you know if they're faced with the innovation, then they can pick it up. There's a, a bonobo called Kanzi. Some of you may have uh, quite a famous bonobo um, uh, subject studied by uh, Sue Savage Rumbaugh uh, in these sort of language learning ex experiments in, in the states. Um, and she takes them out on <coughs> picnics, and there are some wonderful videos, you can probably see that on YouTube, of him going out on a picnic, and they do a barbecue. I mean, he knows how to light a fire, put the pan on, <laughs> get the sausages on. I mean, he, he's learned by observation all of that. So I think you know, the, the, that, that's 
suggest you know, that gypsies have this remarkable social learning ability, but they don't have the, um, the capacity to actually invent uh, these things, and they haven't invented that, they haven't invented fire. We know if he likes the bulb of sausage, he loves it. <laughs> moderately carnivorous. Uh, <laughs> <gypsies. laughs> but in, in the wild situation, I'm just thinking sort of bushfires, and presumably they respond to that in a, in a very kind of runaway. They don't go through it all with looking for a bit of red stitch down the go or something. That's right. I mean, it's interesting. How, how, how did that first happen? I suppose it, it could have been that you know, little volcanic activity in, in East Africa in the kind of rift when uh, you know, the human evolution was going on. There was a lot of fire activity there, and there was a lot of hunting starting, big game hunting starting, become more and more common. And there may have been just chance occurrences uh, there of, of the crossing over of those two things. So that it, got cooked, uh, and then there's the, the social learning ability there, the observation of learning ability there to recognize how that's something I can recreate. That's a speculation. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> well, man, I'd uh, like everybody to um, thank again our speakers this evening. Outside signing copies of her terrific book. So, um, brilliant Christmas present and thoroughly recommended. Thank you all very much for coming.